Can science fiction be considered prior art? Well, if you tried to patent a waterbed any time after the 1950s, you might find yourself feeling a bit like a stranger in a strange land. Scape of IP. This is Stuff You Should Know About IP. Today's episode of Stuff You Should Know About IP is brought to you by The Patent Lawyer Magazine. If you want to stay up to date with everything that's going on in the world of IP and patents, go to www.patentlawyermagazine.com. Each issue is free to read for up to eight weeks. That's www.patentlawyermagazine.com for global news in the world of patents. All right, Tom, I am, I love science fiction, so I am Me too. excited to learn about <laughs> how prior art could be found in science fiction or science fiction could be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can prior science, art to yeah. Something? Right. Can science fiction be used as prior art to block patents? Now, just to give you a quick background in case a few of you don't know this, to get a patent, wherever you are in the world, your invention essentially has to be novel. That means new, useful, right? Mm -hmm. And non-obvious. And by non-obvious, I mean, in, the, in Europe, they call it an inventive step is required to go from what's in the public domain and known and your invention. You need an inventive step. In other words, somebody who's knowledgeable in that field wouldn't say, oh, that's obvious. Based upon what's out there, that's obvious, right? Right. If it's not new or it's, not, or it's obvious, you can't get a patent. So how do you assess whether it's new and also non-obvious? You know, you have to figure out what's in the public domain. And that could be pu publications. You know, it's already been written and described in a publication. It could be products that are in the marketplace. It could be what's on store shelves. You know, it could be marketing material. It could be anything in the public domain that describes your invention in such a way that it's enabled. It actually tells you how to do it, right? Yeah. Because if it's already out there, you can't get a patent. And why, you know, why, why is that? Because think about what you get with a patent. You are offering a deal, essentially. I'm going to, I've got this great idea, this great idea that can help everybody. It's a really cool thing that could make humanity better. It can make our lives easier or faster or whatever it is that makes life better. It does that, right? Right. So I'm going to get in, in exchange for giving up this great idea. I'm going to get a monopoly on that idea for maybe 15 to 20 years, right? It's in the US and different parts of the world, it's like 20 years from the date of filing. So I can prevent everyone from making, using, selling, and even offering to sell my invention if I get a patent on it. That's pretty powerful, right? Yeah. In fact, monopolies are typically illegal, but this is kind of like a legal form of a monopoly, right? right. And I'm being very simplistic about that. It's not a monopoly, but it kind of smells like one, right? Right. So what do you have to do to get this powerful right? Well, you got to give us something that we don't already have. Right. Right. I mean, why would the government of any nation give Ray or Tom a monopoly over our invention, the right to keep other people, everybody in the nation that we get the patent from making, using, selling, or offering to sell if it's already out there? Right. We don't need you. They could say to us, dude, we don't need you. We already have it. I have this article, this, this publication that already described your invention. So go away. Right. So the question is, OK, so this is prior art, relevant prior art that those are publications or other descriptions of inventions that would be relevant to a patent application that is being examined by a patent examiner, right? Mm -hmm. So the patent examiner gets your invention. Ray has filed a patent application on this, whatever this is. He or she then looks all over the world to see <laughs> if they can find a publication that describes your invention so they can block you from getting a patent, which means they don't have to give you that monopoly, right? Because mm -hmm. it's already in the public domain. And just to give you an idea of how broad this could be, a long time ago, I had a client come in to me with this invention for making or cook or um, uh, to cook cone cakes. A cone cake is you take those sugar cones, you know, they got the pointed bottom. Yeah, yeah. Put cupcake stuff in the top. You put it in the oven and it, it, it bakes it. And then you have a cone cake. And 
The challenge was these have pointy bottoms. So how do you stand them up in the oven? So we came up with this device that enables you to stand them up as you slide them into the oven. We ultimately lost because of prior art that was on the back of an ice cream cone box in a supermarket. Wow. So it could be a, a technical article. It could be a conference paper. It could be the back of an ice cream cone box, right? So the question is, can it be science fiction? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, for example, somebody comes up with an invention for a transporter beam. I was right? just thinking that. I was just yeah. thinking like, wait, wait, so if I actually did invent the transporter beam. You'd be rich. I, well, the, <laughs> but would I? Because everybody could just copy me because I wouldn't be able to patent it. Yeah. The question is, is Gene Roddenberry, his show, Star Trek, prior art against your transporter yeah, beam? Yeah, that's what invention. I want to know. Right. I've, I've got the lab going right now and our researchers are working on the transporter beam, but yeah, I'm just dumping a lot of money into R&D for nothing. Right. I got to right, know. Right. Exactly. So the answer in that case would be no, it's not prior art because Gene Roddenberry never disclosed to the public how to actually make it. You'd have to have an enabled disclosure. So we didn't do that. So it got so basically there's two quick things I want to describe to you before we talk about this a little more. One is there's two basic kinds of patents that I'm thinking of. One is called a utility patent and one is a design patent. A utility is all about the function of your invention, right? You have a chair with a, with a, uh, a back, a seat, four legs, and you know two armrests. And if somehow that were not already invented, that could be a utility patent because it's functional, right? You have a functional application of your invention. You can sit down on the thing. Right. But there's also a design patent, which is more related. Not, it's not related to the function. It's related to the ornamental design of your product. Right. So you might have it on the shape of your Tupperware container or of a bottle or something like that. Mm -hmm. the, the design, the ornamental nature of it, as opposed to the function. So you might already be thinking maybe maybe science fiction could be better for design patents than utility patents, because. You don't yeah. have to talk about the function. So, so what got me thinking, I had this discussion a long time ago with my close friend, John Cronin, who's not only a brilliant and prolific inventor in his own right, but he's also a, an IP expert throughout the world. And he and I were out drinking some beers one night, and we were talking about using science fiction as prior art. And, you know, we came up with some obvious examples like the flip phone in Star Trek, you know? They had that device, uh -huh. the communicator, they called it. It was a flip phone. And could that be prior art against flip phones today? So it got me thinking about the nature of science fiction writers. You know, who are these people? So I did a search on three legends in the world of science fiction. And interestingly, you've heard of none of them because we talked about this before. Yeah. But I've heard of all of them because I'm older than you. One of them is Isaac Asimov. One of them is Robert Heinlein, and the other one is Arthur C. Clarke. Big, giant legends in the area of science fiction. And so I did a little research on them, and here's what I discovered. Like, how could these guys come up with inventions? They're just science fiction writers, right? So Isaac Asimov is a legend. He's got like 500 books that he's either written or edited wow. related to science fiction. He also has a master's in chemistry from Columbia and a PhD in chemistry oh from my Columbia. Goodness. He's also a bio, he was also, he's dead now, but he was also a biochemistry professor at Boston University School of Medicine. He also invented, I'm using air quotes because these are not inventions. They're more like, they're just words. He invented the words robotics, robotics and positronic, okay? Now, if you're not a Star Trek Next Generation fan, I don't know if you are or not, Ray. Have you ever watched Star Trek Next Generation? Well, there's a, a commander in the Star Trek uh, universe called Commander Data, who was an artificial intelligence robot. And he has in his brain a positronic brain, okay? <laughs> that comes from Isaac Asimov. It's totally fake, right? But Isaac Asimov is a, he's a science guy. He's right. a- a PhD in chemistry. I mean, when you look at inventors, what are they? They're PhDs. A lot of them are in chemistry. So then I go to Robert Heinlein, who is um, he, his famous like book that you might know of is Stranger in a Strange Land. Mm -hmm. Another thing you might know is Starship Troopers. 
Oh, yeah. Okay, well, that's Robert Heinlein. I love, the, I love that whole series. I, it, yeah, and he did them all, right? And those are his movies, right? Uh, Robert Heinlein, Starship Troopers. The thing about Heinlein is he's not only was a naval officer, but he was an aeronautical engineer. I mean, this is a science guy. This is an inventive guy, right? Then Arthur C. Clarke, another legend. He is 2001, A Space Odyssey. Have oh, you ever heard of that? Right, yes, great. I know, that's him. I haven't read the book. But. <clears throat> okay, the movie is with Stanley Kubrick, mm -hmm. but, but Arthur C. Clarke is the brains. He's the, uh, the writer of this series, right? Yeah. He also was in the Royal Air Force as a radar specialist, and he helped develop something called an early warning radar defense system, okay? He has degrees in physics and mathematics. And wait, there's some other interesting information. So he's a physics guy, a mathematics guy. Yeah. He's also involved in the development of something called geostationary satellites and their applications to telecommunications relays. OK. And he's so well known for this that in that world, there's this spot, which is 22,000 miles or 36,000 kilometers above the Earth's equator is called the Clark orbit after Arthur C. Clark. So this guy is a science guy, but he's a great science fiction writer. So in, 19, um, in 1951, he publishes a book called The Exploration of Space. This is Arthur C. Clarke. It's used by this guy who's a rocket pioneer named Werner von Braun to convince JFK that we could go to the moon, okay? His book is used to convince John F. Kennedy that we could go to the moon. So these are science people. By the way, he has a really cool quote that I read, which I got to read, right? We're talk he's talking to people about whether there's life on other planets, right? Everybody's always wondering that. So he says two possibilities exist. Either we are alone in the universe or we are not alone in the universe. Both are equally terrifying. Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. a great quote, isn't it? Isn't that like, isn't that have to do with the something called the, I want to call it the Fermi paradox, but it's like if there's- if Oh, Fermi there's, after the guy who developed the firm or whose name the Fermi lab is named after? I might be, might be, might not be the right term. Like, okay, but what is it anyway? It's, it's that if, um, if there, if there, if there is no life outside of earth that, it's an indication that in order for life to um, to become complex enough to leave its own solar system, that there, that gap between jumps is too yeah. big for for life to to get out to get out at all. Right, right. To get out of where right. we will all there will be no humanity because it'll never escape. You know, our, right. our solar system. And, yeah, we and have a, an inverse of that, but I'm not going to even try to quote it. Yeah, but, but our human off topic. Yeah, the human existence has a single point of failure, which is Earth. Right. But if we could get out, then we have more places that humanity yeah. can continue to flourish. And Elon, uh, if you're if you're listening, I mean, I know you're listening because of course, of course. Fan. Why wouldn't you be? We're fully in support of the Moon colony or of the Mars colony. Mars colony. I'm Anything totally you can in do support. to help from an IP standpoint. Just let us know. Yeah. Here's a funny thing. You know the movie The Martian? It's also a book, The Martian? Yeah. Yeah, the book, The Martian, was so good. I listened to it on Audible, and I arrived at my destination. I was driving, like, to D.C. or something. I arrived at my destination, and I was still had an hour to go, so I just sat in the hotel parking lot to get through The Martian. It was so good. Then I watched the movie. Somebody I know who's not that bright, but she said to me, wait, is that real? Did we actually do that? Oh, we no. Been to Mars? Yeah. <laughs> but so maybe we've already been there. But anyway... So these people, though, are people of science. Yeah. So it's not hard to see how they could invent stuff and put it in their stories and then have that serve as prior art, right? Mm -hmm. So let's go to the waterbed example, because you discussed that at the beginning, and that is Heinlein. So Robert Heinlein writes three books that are relevant to this. 1942, something called Beyond This Horizon, 1956, Double Star, and 1961, Stranger in a Strange Land. So Heinlein was also a naval officer, and I might get this wrong. For if, so if there's any Robert Heinlein fans that are listening, forgive me for this, but I think he was convalescing in the hospital, and he was imagining how you could make a more comfortable bed hmm. on water. So he developed this waterbed in great detail that he put it in these three publications, 
Then in 1968, wait, yeah, 1968, a guy named Charles Hall, he actually created the first commercial waterbed. And when he filed a patent application for it, he was rejected because of Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land. So we wow. know that that can be prior art the, yeah. the, the, because it was disclosed thoroughly. Because again, with your transporter beam that you're working on, you don't have to worry about Gene Roddenberry because it right. was just, you know, it's a black box. Who the hell knows how it works? But in this case, he did it with enough specificity that someone who's an expert in that field could actually make it based upon his description. Right. So it's prior art. And poor Charles Hall, who had this brilliant idea to have a waterbed, he could sleep in it, but he couldn't block other people from making it and putting it in the market as well. Right. By the way, it's too bad because like in the 70s, waterbeds were really a big thing. Really? Like you're, yeah, you're way too young to remember that. But I remember waterbeds were like a really hot thing. Yeah, I yeah. got in one once uh, and wasn't really thrilled. You weren't thrilled. Well, well maybe, maybe, there, waterbeds maybe there wasn't enough water to your liking. <laughs> But yeah. in fact, they're so they were so popular. They're now in rental agreements because you know I'm a landlord now. I own a few rental properties. Uh -huh. I, I got a standard rental agreement, and they all say you can't have water beds. Why? Because they were so popular. Because if they pop, you know, you got oh, water everywhere. Yeah, it could cause damage. Can you imagine all that water going through? I'm just looking at my ceilings. Can you imagine pouring through your ceilings? That wouldn't yeah, be cool. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's Robert Heinlein and the water bed, but. There's another cool case because we got to use another one of our great legendary science fiction writers, Arthur C. Clarke, who does 2001 Space Odyssey. In 2011, Apple, a little company called Apple, I think it's a fruit company, they, um, <laughs> they create this device called the iPhone, maybe you've heard of it, and they sue Samsung because of their Galaxy iPhone and tablets, right? And they sue them based upon the screens for their design patents, okay? Now, these are design patents. So, again, utility patents, you've got to really disclose it in science fiction so that somebody can make it if you want to be prior art against a utility patent. But a design patent, that's just the ornamental uh, design of your, of your uh, product, right? Mm -hmm. So that you can see it. So get a load of this. In 2011, imagine... The, the collision of these giants of Apple and Samsung, right? Yeah. I like mean, Godzilla you, versus King Kong. Yeah. Do you think that these giants are hi hiring lightweight lawyers? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. They're probably hiring the best and the brightest lawyers we have to offer. And by we, I mean, I don't mean the Colson Law Group. I mean humanity, right? <laughs> right. And they're not just hiring one. There is a team. It's, it's like a it's like a giant team of lawyers, like you know, in an organized tight phalanx. Oh my, yeah, ex yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. This is a team of brilliant lawyers, right? The defense, you know, what they did in the defense for Samsung, they brought so so a preliminary junk injunction motion is filed by Apple against Samsung, and you might remember. Preliminary injunction motion is, hey, if you judge let this, if you let them keep infringing our patent, we will be irreparably harmed by the time this case gets through litigation in two or three years. Mm -hmm. You got to stop them today, pending the outcome of litigation. And that's a pretty serious ask, right? Because yeah. you're asking the court to essentially make a decision before all the proof is in, right? And because right. if you get shut down on preliminary injunction for two or three years, you might be done. Right. So they make a preliminary injunction motion. Samsung defends themselves by saying this patent is invalid based upon a disclosure from Arthur C. Clarke and Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. OK, because in 2001 A Space Odyssey, they had these screens that were touch screens and information was popping up and it was used by these space people. Right. So these brilliant lawyers, these are not people, these are not ham and eggers that have billboards up that are describing their personal injury, you know, exploits. These are high capability, high brain, intellectual property litigators. Okay. And their response was Arthur C. Clarke's 2001 A Space Odyssey. Yeah. Now, I read an article about it, and the article indicated that the court did not or the court granted the preliminary, or I'm sorry, the court grant ruled against Samsung 
but for procedural reasons, not because of their use of science fiction as prior art. So that's can, pretty. Can you say that again? Because yeah, and by the way, I'm not total. I don't know what the procedural grounds were, but the article was very short, and it just said it was emphasizing that the court did not reject them because of their use of science fiction. Interesting. Yeah. So it wasn't on that basis. Right. Right. So then the third one that I wanted to mention, which is worth mentioning, I'd love to do an Isaac Asimov one to round this out with all three, but I don't have an Isaac Asimov one, but I've got another great prolific legend. And by prolific, I mean, he's everywhere, right? This is a guy that everyone knows. His name is Donald Duck. Do you know this person? I'm sorry, who? Donald Duck. Is it, oh, oh yeah, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Donald Duck, come on, you know who Donald Duck is, right? Come on, Donald. Yeah, he ran for most, president, didn't he? He's the most famous duck on earth, I think, right? So here's the story of Donald Duck and how Donald Duck played into prior art. So there was a, um, a famous case in the 60s. I'm kind of looking down to read a little bit here um, where a freighter, uh, the Al Kuwait was capsized at the docks of Kuwait's harbor. The ship was carrying 5,000 sheep that started decomposing in the harbor's water. Since this threatened to contaminate the city of Kuwait's drinking water supply, the ship had to be raised as quickly as possible, okay? Okay. So this guy, a Danish inventor, Carl Kroyer, he comes up with this idea to take a tube and fill it with plastic balls and fill the ship with plastic balls and make it buoyant so that it'll float to the surface, right? Okay. And it actually worked. They saved, I guess it cost them 300, they had 27 million plastic balls, 27 million plastic balls. What? And they filled it and apparently it raised the ship and they, the, uh, the cost was 345,000 US dollars but it saved the insurance company almost or over $2 million for the ship. Wow. So anyway, this guy files for a patent application and the Danish or the Dutch patent office, the Dutch patent office rejects them based upon prior art, which was a 1947. Let's see. I want to make sure I get this right. It was a 1949 Donald Duck story called the sunken yacht by Carl Barks, which shows Donald and his nephews raising a ship by filling it with ping pong balls shoved through a tube, as can be shown through the image. Now, I'm certain that you can do better than I'm going to do by putting this up on the screen right now, right? Yeah. You can yeah. probably do better than I'm right. going to do. Your cue. But it was considered prior art and it blocked his patent in um in that he tried to get in uh in in the netherlands so that is that's that's crazy donald that's crazy uh, prevented right? patent exactly so the final thing i want to mention on this is to give you the other side of it which are we mentioned the transporter beam mm -hmm. right there's also something called a lightsaber you heard of that oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. someone actually made one like a legit lightsaber that kind of works and it okay. looks like a real lightsaber well, that's pretty cool because star wars would not be prior art against that lightsaber huh. if it's a utility patent because you don't know how it works right star wars doesn't teach you how it works so it would not be prior art. but but if there were a design patent on that lightsaber it might be right because there it's the ornamental design that's inventive and not the functional part Right. The other things I was thinking of are uh, warp speed. You know what warp speed is, right? Yeah, it's where they go. They go really fast. Fast through space. Yeah, although somebody was trying to explain it to me once, how it's like you don't move, but the universe moves, or something like that. Like I don't know. Holding, you any... holding space on itself. Yeah, yeah, I don't know what any of that means, but it's not described enough that if somebody came up with warp speed, it would be prior art. And the other example, have you ever heard of a show called Stargate? Uh yes. yes. SG One or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was actually a movie with uh, Kurt Russell and yeah. somebody else who's famous. That does not have a sufficient description to be considered prior art. Interesting. So yeah. it really, it really, it has to be 
described clearly unless you're talking about a design patent. And then it has to be shown clearly, and right? Then- because again, utility patents. So you, in order to block someone's, because remember, you can't patent an idea or a concept. It's got to be something that you can actually make. It's got to be useful, right? right? Your idea has to be such that somebody can, after you describe it in your patent application, it can somebody reasonably skilled in the art, somebody who does that sort of thing can actually make it. So it's the same goes with prior art. If you want to use your prior art to block a competitive patent, that prior art must actually show how the thing is made. And really how fascinating. Works. Yeah, I, yeah, I would not have guessed that you could use science fiction to prevent an actual patent application. But I think probably the most interesting thing for me personally, at least, is that all of these science fiction writers are such prolific scientists themselves. There's I know. The, 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 the line between science and fiction, you know, makes you think that it's just pure inventive, you know, imaginary inventiveness, not like actual real inventiveness backed up by scientific knowledge where they're just sort of fantasizing a little on top of what they know. No, yeah, this is, that which is what it is, which is makes it so much cooler and makes me want to go back and, you know, read some science fiction. Yeah, I'm that. Yeah, that is the thing that impressed me the most in doing a little bit of research for this podcast is how impressive these great science fiction writers are as scientists. But now it makes sense, right? Right. And now I'm also my hopes of ever becoming a science fiction writer <laughs> are are dashed because it'll it won't I won't I I need to go back and get my PhD. I guess. Listen, you want it? Here's here's a funny thing. When I went back after law school to get my chemistry degree, yeah. I did not go back to be a patent lawyer. I went back to get my chemistry degree, uh, degree to become a science fiction writer. That is why I went back to get my <laughs> chemistry degree. Is but, that why you wanted to do this podcast so bad? Yeah, no, but, but. Is this, is this you know, your, like, are you going to reveal now your plans? Yeah, because I'm a, you know I'm a closet writer. But I was married at the time and I would have, I'm divorced but I would have been divorced a lot sooner if I told my ex, my wife at the time, I'm going to be spending four nights a week, four hours to five hours a night after work. And then all day on Saturday and all day on Sunday, studying chemistry for the next four years. If I said it was going to be to be a science fiction writer, she would have immediately divorced me. So I came up with this patent law idea. Which was way and more now practical. here we are, everyone. Right, and here we are. <laughs> now we're doing a, pat, a podcast not on science fiction writing, but on intellectual property. Well, I, I'm looking forward to your first science fiction novel. Perhaps it could be something to do with gene editing and superhumans and yeah, I don't know. Ray, you might be looking forward to my second one. No, oh, I'm right. only kidding. Oh, I thought you were going to like, can we just get the title of it? No, 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 I'm not. I'm totally joking. Everyone, thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Stuff You Should Know About IP, uh, prior art, and science fiction. Are they one and the same? Possibly, we learned today. So thank you for tuning in. If you like this, hit the subscribe button, share it with your friends, and we'll see you next time. See ya. Yeah.